Hello again. This is part two of Thoughts on Original Sin. To recap from part one, just a quick recap. We were looking, first we uh, looked at the Council of Trent and it what it says about original sin. And I guess when I said it's also a Protestant doc, uh, doctrine, not necessarily. Uh, there are some differences. Uh, Protestants will agree that there is an original sin from Adam and Eve that um, stuck with mankind ever since. But they don't always agree on baptizing infants. Um, because it's more of a baptize. Baptism is something that the person themselves chooses to do and that it is a declaration that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So uh, that's why they don't consider infant baptism as um, the way to go. So uh, there is that difference but on the actual thing about babies being born in sin uh, most Protestants will agree with that notion, but not with the baptizing of infants. There's a, a difference there. Where the Roman Catholics, that's the very reason they baptize infants, because they're born in sin. And they must be baptized immediately or else, for some reason, God will not let them into heaven. Or It's got to do with things like that. So... On our last video, after looking at the Council of Trent, we explored some scriptures about infants, mainly, and about how God um, makes changes to things from time to time. And so I thought, uh, first, maybe we'll just do a quick review and summary of part one. Uh, just to get a handle on where we are because this is quite a deep talk topic so we don't want to lose our way on this we're going to stick with it and you know it's easy to follow down a lot of different rabbit holes when you study something like this so our main focus is on babies uh, what is the state of babies and sin? Um, that is their main thing. Babies and small children. Um, you know, uh, what is it about babies? So, in our first video, after exploring, uh, reading the Council of Trent, uh, Session 5, which is the session regarding original sin. Um, we first took a look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is transgression of the law. And the devil sins from the beginning. And whoever are the children of God do not sin. And that... Uh, uh, to not sin is to lo love one another, not as Cain, who killed his brother. That's the opposite of loving one another. So that's um, what First John chapter 3 is talking about. So that gives us an idea of uh, what sin is exactly. It's transgression of the law of God. And Jesus and the apostles, they taught that to love one another is to fulfill the law. That's what the law is, to love one another. So uh, Cain did the exact opposite of that by killing his brother Abel in the Garden of Eden. So then we took a look at Luke chapter 2, verse 23, uh, where Mary is being pure, finished her purification rites from giving birth and um, where it says every male firstborn is holy to God 
So how can the male firstborn be holy, born holy, when it's a son of Adam? It's not talking about only Jesus. It says every male firstborn. Okay, and then uh, that that um, idea comes from Exodus chapter 13, verse 12. Every firstborn male, man and beast, belongs to God. And... Um, in the New Testament, we see that that notion is taken as every firstborn male is holy. And you cannot be holy if you are full of sin. Okay, now, Matthew chapter 18, uh, Jesus talks, uh, he talks about this in a few other Gospels as well, I believe. He says, okay, unless you become like a little child... You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So, if a child is a sinful little child, then why would you, why would he say that if the child is a sinful little child? Um, to become a little child and be converted and become like a little child. So what is, what is it to be like a little child? Well, we found out in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39 that children have no knowledge of good and evil that's uh, uh, partly what makes them innocent because they don't have the capacity to understand good and evil and if you remember Adam and Eve's sin in the beginning was to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so it was them gaining the knowledge of good and evil that brought sin into the world and death because God say, said the day you eat of it is the day you will die so how does that work is the knowledge of good and evil brings death well the Apostle Paul, he explains that very well in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 7. Is the law sin? No, the law shows us what sin is. And without law, sin is dead. But the commandment came, I was once without sin. And then when the law came, then sin revived. The law showed me what sin is and told me what not to do. And then my, by my nature, I did that. And then I sinned and I died. So it's the same thing. It's the knowledge of good and evil that brings death, according to Paul in Romans chapter 7. So... Um, the law is holy, but sin is evil. And uh, I am carnal, sold under sin. Now this is alluding to uh, Adam and Eve, that the flesh is, is, uh, has a, a propensity to, to sin. The flesh is weak. And so Paul then talks about um, the the. By, by the flesh I sin, but by my mind I love the law of God. Therefore it is not me sinning, it is the flesh sinning. And then using the law of the Spirit um, that I believe to overcome the law of the sinful flesh. That the flesh, the, to overcome the weakness of the flesh and to bring the flesh under the law and, and, and to obedience. So it's more along those lines, which is a, um, an adult, mature adult thing to do. It's not something that children do. And um, by saying in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39, that children god directly says children have no knowledge of good and evil therefore they have no uh, responsibility towards sin 
Okay. Now, um, in Numbers 14, 18, God says he would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children for the third and fourth generation. He also says that in Exodus chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments. So, um, there's that, that generational sin that from the third and fourth generation back when you were born, you are inheriting the sin of your fathers. But if we look at Ezekiel chapter 18, that notion was changed. God said, no longer will we do it that way. Now, each sin is responsible for its own. I mean, each soul is responsible for its own sins. And the soul that sins shall die. So, uh, if a, if a sinful person changes their ways and becomes righteous, then their sin will no longer be remembered. And at the same time, if a righteous person turns away from righteousness and starts sinning, their righteousness will no longer be remembered. So it's w according to who you are is how you will be judged. So that um, kind of tosses out the idea of uh, generational sins. Um, since Ezekiel chapter 18. Uh, now before that, uh, it seems to be that there was a generational sin. And then um, we also looked at Genesis chapter 3, 17, where uh, the, the, the judgment on Adam was cursed as the ground for your sake. But then in uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, uh, after Noah offered a sacrifice, then God said, No longer will I curse the ground for man's sake, because man's heart is evil from his youth. So there is an evilness from youth that a man must overcome. Um, so there is the, the it's uh, as Paul described it in Romans chapter 7, it's the uh, sold under sin, the weakness of the flesh. The flesh cannot please God. It has no desire to please God. It has only a desire to please itself. Then we looked at um, Leviticus chapter 12, which is the um, chapter that describes the purification of a woman after giving birth and how a sin offering is made on behalf of the woman to atone for her birth and uh, it's got to do with touching of blood and things like that um, but there is a, a sin offering also but there is no sin offering given for the child um, because I suppose there's no reason for it or there's no logic to it because the child when you think of a baby what does what's the two things a baby does or three things it eats sleeps and one or other thing so that's that's the needs of the flesh completely so um, does the baby have any um, consciousness of sin or does the baby have any responsibility towards sin I don't think so it's it's just a, a it's a growing baby it's it's actually called holy by God if it is a firstborn male so if a firstborn male is holy even though it acts the same way as every other baby, then why would other babies be unholy? You know, they're, they're not unholy. They're just common babies. The, in Hebrew, um, there's holy, unholy, and common. Where common is not unholy or holy. It's just the, the majority. It's just the common. So, 
I would say babies would be common or holy. Um, I don't see where they would be unholy unless there was some real weird stuff going on. Now, so from what we found out in looking at the scriptures in the last video, we came up with uh, four basic things to understand is that first sin is from understanding the law and breaking it. That is the sin. That is the conscience. Your start conscience comes into play and that's the sin and the guilt. Okay? It's a knowledge of good and evil that brings sin. And number two, children have no knowledge of good and evil. And but they do have a flesh that is sinful. Okay? And then three, the flesh is sinful by nature because it only cares about itself mainly. And it is not saved. The, the spirit is saved. Um, Paul says, uh, when we are resurrected, we will be resurrected into a new body, into an immortal flesh. So this flesh that is not immortal does not get uh, saved. It's, you get a new flesh, a new body. Now, and number four, uh, children become of age and then become responsible for their own sins, not other people's sins. Be due to Ezekiel chapter 18. So, the, the, and, and in the New Testament also, uh, Paul or Jesus will say the flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that is saved. The flesh has, that doesn't profit anything. Other than maybe, you know, being in a safer life, <laughs> being, uh, you know, in a more fulfilling life by following the spirit and by having a spirit in it that follows God, it, but that's a, the only way it really profits. It really uh, um, doesn't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Um, it goes back to the dust. So that's what we came up with. And so now we're going to take that sort of basic understanding of how this works and look at... Um, I was going to look at Paul's um, verses, you know, that uh, are typically used to justify um, original sin. But I think what we'll do is we'll just go uh, straight into the looking at the, once again, at the Council of Trent. Because the Council of Trent, using the footnotes, we'll look at those footnotes they will bring up the same verses anyway. So we'll um, just go straight to the Council of Trent now with this understanding that we have of what sin is and how it, how it applies. And uh, let's see how much uh, the Council of Trent follows that narrative and what scriptures they use to justify what they're talking about. Okay, so let's take a look at this book again, Council of Trent. Uh, I introduced it in the first video. And um, I'm going to start with the first page, but I'm not going to go, I'm not going to bother with the introduction okay so starting with the uh, number one in the middle of the page if anyone does not confess that the first man Adam when he transgressed the commandment of God in paradise immediately lost the holiness and justice in which he had been constituted and through the offense of that prevarication okay, what's a prevar 
What's a prevarication, first of all? Prevaricate. Uh, to evade by a quirk or quibble. To evade the truth. So, evading evidence. Okay, so the offense of that prevarication incurred the wrath and indignation of God, and thus death, with which God had previously threatened him. And then they uh, reference in 4, Genesis 2.17. And we look here and we see, okay, Genesis 2.17. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day you eat it you shall surely die. Okay, so by eating that tree and disobeying God, then he brought on what God had threatened him with. Okay. Fair enough. And together with death, captivity under his power, who thenceforth had the empire of death, that is to say, the devil. So Adam not only had death, but became under the empire of the devil. Okay, and uh, the scripture they give for that one, is Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 let's take a look okay Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 for as much then as the children are the partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Okay, so the devil has the power of death. Now, if we look at verse 15, so he might destroy him that had the power of death, the devil, and deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their life subject to bondage. Okay, so those who were afraid of, through the fear of death, were, they were subject to bondage. So, um, Jesus took away the fear of death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Right? Okay, so fair enough. So Adam was brought under the empire of death, that was the devil, the fear of death. Um, and that the entire Adam, that is all mankind, through that offense of prevarication, evading the truth, was changed in body and soul for the worse. Okay, so that all of mankind was changed in body and soul for the worse by Adam eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let's see, they use, uh, now they use a synod of orange. Um, that's a Catholic uh, synod. I'm not gonna go there. Um, now, body and soul for the worse. So Adam's body and soul got messed up by bringing it under the devil through the original sin of eating the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Now Okay, the knowledge of good and evil brings the knowledge of sin. Because the knowledge of good and evil is the law. When you read the law, then you have a knowledge of good and evil. You know what is evil and what is good. And so 
you you end up sinning and it is that sin that came from knowing what was wrong and doing what is wrong so now changed in body and soul for the worse so Adam through sinning and breaking the law was changed in body and soul for the worse um, I guess you could argue that in body because now he brings death and in soul because you are now um, at odds with God you are now uh, under condemnation so yeah okay a, there's a state of disobedience to God through the sin of Adam but when we talk about babies let's talk about babies for a minute so the baby doesn't have any knowledge of good and evil and but the baby still has death and he's still born into a sinful flesh right that is uh, inclined to do evil because the flesh only cares about itself and not about the things of God or things of others a, a baby is very selfish uh, especially a newborn or a young baby they want what they want and they don't want what they don't want and what they want most is sleep and food so that's the flesh so uh, but I mean okay if Adam and Eve did not eat the no the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, would a baby still cry? Would a baby still want fruit? Would a baby still want sleep? You know, or would the baby grow up in a nurturing environment and become a a, a person um well um maybe if Adam and Eve were eternal there would be no babies there would be no need to propagate the human race uh, because they would just live forever why would they need children to uh, propagate the race because in the book of Enoch uh, God says that he gave man the ability to produce children because they die uh, along with death came the ability to propagate the, the race so I guess that's a part of the fallen state perhaps um, eternal people they don't have a need to um, to prolong their their existence by propagating others so anyway so anyone who does not believe the Adam and Eve by sinning were brought under the empire of death that is run by the devil and that Adam was changed in body and soul for the worse let him be anathema um, I would say I agree with with that statement except the part of let him be anathema but uh, anyway let's carry on number two because of what the anathema carries all right uh, if you love one another and don't do as Cain did and um, don't uh, kill your brother then why are you burning him at the stake and boiling him in oil because he disagrees with you you know it's uh, it's not a good way to convince them is what I'm saying about the anathema part okay number two if anyone asserts that the transgression of Adam injured him alone and not his posterity and then they use uh, number seven first Corinthians 15 21 let's take a look at that 
1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. By man came death. Okay. So if anyone asserts that the transgression of Adam injured him alone and not his posterity, okay, I can agree with that. By man came death. Because he sinned, he brought death into the world. And that the holiness and justice which he received from God, which he lost, he lost for himself alone, if anyone says that, and not for us also, or that he being defiled by the sin of disobedience has transfused only death and the pains of the body into the whole human race, but not sin also which is the death of the soul, let him be anathema. Well, um, if anyone doesn't say this, well, I could say that, but I could also say in Ezekiel chapter 18 that God seems to have changed that and says, No longer will I bring the sins of the fathers upon the sons, but each soul will die in its own sin. That uh, the whole chapter of Ezekiel 18 talks about that. So um, they don't address that at all here. So they're still talking about Adam as if, um, you know, it just carried on. Um, now death came into the world and this is the death of the flesh right and death seems to have carried on right up to a Christ because it says um, verse 17 hang on what what verse was it Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Through Christ, right? For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Okay, so by man death came into the world and by man the resurrection of the dead so it's not the end of death but death and then resurrection okay so um so yeah So if anyone says that Adam lost it only by himself or for himself and not for others, well, death, you could say, yeah, he lost it for everyone and the whole human race, which is the death of the soul. Well, um, hmm. Well, see, now, what do you mean by soul? What's the talk? What are they talking about, the soul? Is it the, the flesh or the spirit? Uh, a soul is the flesh, right? But I think in the Catholic uh, sense, they have a different idea of the soul. So... Um, so I don't know what, uh, they're not, they're not defining the death of the soul here. Okay. So I don't know whether I could agree with that or not, but anyway, um, since he can now let him be anathema since he contradicts the apostle who says by one man, sin entered into the world and by sin, death. 
and so death passed upon all men in whom all have sinned. 8. Romans 5.12 So this is the one that um, the Protestants will use a lot of talking about original sin. 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, okay, that's Adam, the soul that sins shall die, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Okay, so he goes on. He says, now, you know, let's think about Romans chapter 7 here. It's the same book exactly. So he was saying, I was alive until the law came, and then sin came, and I died. So what's he talking about here? He says, for, because, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death ruled from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So, by death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Now, okay, so he's saying, okay, until the law of Moses was in the world, sin is not imputed when there is no law. Uh, so there's no guilt, and there's no uh, condemnation uh, brought by guilt. Um, so he's saying, okay, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So, even those who had not disobeyed directly God, death reigned over them. Um, over Adam's transgression, and Adam is the figure of him that was to come. So that was Adam before he sinned. The perfect man is the figure of Christ. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense one, through the offense of one, many are dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded to many. So he's saying, okay, now Adam was a figure of Christ that was to come. So I think he's what he's saying is that the the sacrifice of Christ also covers those people who died even though sin was not imputed, death ruled over them, even those who had not sinned like Adam sinned. Um that um, the, the sacrifice of Christ covers them also. But then the law came. Now when the law came, uh, you have a choice to make. And, and you actively sin when you know the law. So that's a different situation. Okay. So it still um, sort of says, okay, death to all men and the flesh is sinful. Um, but I suppose before Christ died, the souls also were uh, um, sinful or, or carrying the sin. Now, so now three. If anyone asserts that this sin of Adam, which in, which in its origin is one, and by propagation, not by imitation. So, even though um, you may not imitate Adam and, and do what Adam did, you still get the sin. And it's transfused into everyone. 
which is in each one something that is his own, is taken away either by the forces of human nature or by a remedy other than the merit of the one mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, then they use number 9, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Okay, I know that. Yeah, I just looked it up because uh, I'm going to look them all up. Okay, now, so who has reconciled us to God in his own blood, made unto us justice, sanctification, and redemption, number 10, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Right. So Jesus Christ made to us, gives us. Jesus Christ is our wisdom. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus Christ is our sanctification. Jesus Christ is our redemption. I agree with that also. Okay. Or, if he denies that the merit of Jesus Christ is applied to both adults and infants by the sacri sacrament of baptism, rightly administered in the form of the church. Okay, here's a part that might be a bit contentious. Okay, let him be a th anathema. If, okay, if anyone denies the merit of Jesus Christ is applied both to adults and infants by baptism. If anyone says that, let him be anathema or, or denies that. Okay, now, now here's where we got to think a little bit. Okay, let's take a look at some... Um, searches on uh, being baptized okay Matthew and they were baptized of him in the Jordan that would be John the Baptist confessing their sins okay then came Jesus to be baptized and John forbade him saying I need to be baptized by you Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Okay, so there's men and women. And here, okay, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. They believed and were baptized. Okay, and there's this one, okay. And he said to them, what, what then were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Then Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Okay, so, so this is the rebaptized in the name of Jesus. So John's baptism, Paul decided that that wasn't enough, and they should be baptized in the name of Jesus. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, uh, which is different than in the name of Jesus Christ, which is a baptism of faith. So there's something there. Yeah, 
And he says, uh, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Ghost. And he said to them, Unto what were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Okay, so that's interesting. So there's a baptism, has to be the right baptism. And you should be rebaptized if you weren't baptized into the faith in Jesus. That's important. Even the people who um, were baptized under John the Baptist, the baptism of repentance, were rebaptized by Paul to the baptism of faith in Christ. You see, so whether it's repentance or faith in Christ, the actual act of the baptism wasn't what counted. What counted is the faith. So that kind of leaves babies out, doesn't it? And then you'll know you're not that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even though we should also walk in newness of life. Because baptism is like you're, you're being dipped into the water. It's like a death and a resurrection that you're, you're symbolizing in, um, when you do that. So, uh, and you're also publicly proclaiming your faith in Jesus Christ. That's also important. So a saying, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in sin? Um, so you become dead to sin and, and you begin to live in a newness of life. So how does this apply to a baby, right? Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should all also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in he died, he died to sin once. But in that he lived, he lives to God. Likewise, reckon also yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Net, let not sin reign in your mortal body. Okay, so, you know, with the Protestant churches, like the Baptist, I think, um, you'll find that their children are, are usually baptized somewhere around the age of 12 or so, where they, um, they come and ask to be baptized because they've been taught the scriptures and they understand what baptism is, they understand what sin is, and they make the decision. And then they become baptized. And so I, I guess uh, 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 before that, um, their uh, salvation is um, reckoned in the fact that they are children and, and they're not really uh, culpable for their sins in the, in the way that adults are. You know, and everybody still dies, so the sins of Adam upon the flesh, well, that doesn't get washed off by baptism anyway. And it's more got to do with the sins of the Spirit, or, or this, the rejuvenation of the Spirit. And then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, coming into your body with you and overcoming the sins of the flesh. So the flesh still isn't saved. The flesh is never saved. The flesh is just a vehicle for the, for the spirit. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So when all things are subjected to the Son, the Son will subject himself to God and all things with himself. Okay, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? if the dead do not rise. Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I die daily. If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some do not have the knowledge of God. Okay? This is what it's about. Having the knowledge of God. And, and standing up for God. With God. So this is why the um, Protestants take a little bit different stand on baptism and that have, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew or Greek or bond or free male or female you are all one in Christ Jesus and if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise see So, wherefore, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So, understanding good and evil, and falling under sin, and understanding that, that is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ who saves us. That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So you've graduated from the law and of sin and death. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So how does this apply to a baby? Or to a young child? Um, how, you know, who can't even talk yet, for instance. So there's the big question here about you know does do do you actually baptize babies like without them knowing good or evil or confessing anything um, what um, power does it have there's nothing in the in the New Testament really about it there's some maybe maybe illusions to being a being a Abraham's seed or things like that but it it's always seems to be connected to confessing okay so now we'll carry on with number three uh, once that declaration behold the Lamb of God behold him who takes away the sins of the world that's in John 1 29 and the other, as many of you as have been baptized have put on Christ. We've already looked at that. Galatians 3.27. Well, we haven't looked at that one. Let's take a quick look. Yeah, we've already looked at this one. It's as many of you, you're no longer under a schoolmaster. So, how is a baby no longer under a schoolmaster? and putting on Christ by faith. Okay. Um, now number four. If anyone denies that infants newly born from their mother's wombs are to be baptized, even though they are born of baptized parents, or says they are indeed baptized for the remission of sins, 
but that they derive nothing of original sin from Adam, which must be ex expiated by the laver of regeneration for the, the attainment of eternal life. So is, they're saying, okay, without being baptized, you cannot have eternal life. And so, you know, from the time of being born up until you're 12 years old and able to decide, um, in the in the Old Testament it would say 20 years old, okay? Uh, so during that time, when you have no knowledge of good or evil, um, how can you be saved without being baptized? Well, how can you be condemned without knowing anything, without knowing the difference between good and evil? There's, there's that question also. It's like, well, because of Adam, you're going to die. Okay, yeah, they die. But how can they be condemned and shut out of the kingdom of God without ever knowing good or evil? That's a good question that they fail to address. Okay. So the sin of Adam brought death and uh, fear of the, de the, the, the kingdom of the devil, as we learned it, he uses the fear of death, not death itself, but the fear of death to enslave people. Well, babies don't have any fear of death because they don't even know what death is. Okay. So they're not under the kingdom of the devil, which is based on the fear of death. They're just living and they don't really know much. Okay. By one man, okay, as the apostle said, by one man sin entered into the world and by sin death. So death passed upon all men in whom all have sinned. Okay. And they use Romans 5.12. Well, we have already looked at Romans 5.12. And um, in order to sin, you have to know the difference between good and evil. You have to know the law. So that kind of counts babies out again. Like they haven't addressed that that no knowledge of good or evil uh, by the law, sin came and I died. Well, how could that happen to a baby? And there was no sin offering for a baby. So that's probably why, because how could the baby sin? He doesn't know how to sin. He doesn't know how not to sin. He doesn't know anything. Okay, so it is not to under this is not to be understood otherwise than as the Catholic Church has everywhere and al always understood it. Well, always, like since when? They'll say since Peter the Apostle, but really the Catholic Church was formed by the Emperor of Rome, Constantine. In 325, Constantine presided over the uh, Nicene Council. He was the leader of the Nicene Council, not the Bishop of Rome. It was Constantine, the Emperor. That was the Holy Roman Catholic Church. It was run by the government of Rome. For in the virtue of this rule of faith handed down from the apostles, even infants who could not as yet commit any sin of themselves, okay, there it is right there, infants could, here now they're going to talk about it, 
infants who could not yet commit any sin themselves, are for this re reason truly baptized for the remission of sins. Okay, well, what, the remission of what sins? Sins from Adam or sins from their forefathers? In Ezekiel chapter 18, everyone dies for their own sins. So, babies haven't committed any sins. And it doesn't wash away death. The death that comes from Adam, the de that's the the that's the the the, the sinful flesh. The, the flesh is fallen, but the the spirit isn't. Okay. In order that in them they contracted by generation, well, according to Ezekiel chapter eighteen that no longer happens okay may be washed away by regeneration and then they say 16 uh, that's uh, quoting some other Catholic doctrine um, okay so again you know how can the baby have the remission of sin when they can't have sin in the first place um, and the, the sin of the flesh is not washed away because even after you're baptized you still have to overcome the sinful flesh but your spirit is rejuvenated okay then it says okay for unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven okay so let's see that one that is John 3 5 Okay, this is a good one. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher from God. No man can do the miracles that you do except God is with him. Jesus sent, said to him, Verily I say to you, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Okay, like a baby? Jesus answered, Verily I say to you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, so born of water and of the spirit well to me what that means is okay when when a, a baby is born you've heard the uh the that a woman the first sign that the birth is going to happen is her water breaks so i think that's what he means by being born of water is um you're born twice, you see, once of water and once of the Spirit. And so the baptism is being born of the Spirit. Now, that could also be baptized and born of the Spirit. So, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, this process is, is um, you know, confessing and understanding and believing, being born, baptized and born of this, and reborn of the Spirit. So, babies can't do all of that, okay? You cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Marvel not that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants and you hear the sound, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. 
Okay, so, you know, the spirit is not a tangible thing. It's like the wind. So, it's the spirit that benefits from believing and being baptized. The flesh doesn't benefit. And a baby, you know, they are pretty much flesh. It's, it's, uh, it wants to eat and sleep. Um, not to say that it doesn't have the Spirit of God, because that's life. But where's the sin? Where's the breaking of the law? Where's the, the, the um, turning away from God? Um, it's not possible. Okay. Number five. If anyone denies that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is conferred in baptism, the guilt of original sin is remitted. Now here we go. Um, if the guilt of original sin is remitted, what is this original sin? So if we look at Ezekiel chapter 18, each man is responsible for his own sins and he doesn't get any sin from his father or his grandfather. So the original sin of Adam brought death into the flesh and it also brought the propensity for the flesh to be selfish and to, to, to sin um, out of its own selfish desires. So that doesn't go away when you're baptized. You have to overcome that after you're baptized. So um, what are they talking about? That the guilt of original sin. Um, God says that that guilt in Ezekiel chapter 18 God says there is no guilt from the Father each man is guilty for his own sins so that one's kind of dead in the water that idea okay the guilt of original sin or the whole of that which belongs to the essence of sin well no, the flesh, the flesh doesn't get purified in baptism. It's, it's only the soul. It's only, well, soul is a bit of a loaded word. It's only the spirit, the spirit and your belief. And, and you're receiving the Holy Spirit of God that um, gets rejuvenation. The flesh is still the same. Still has the same desires. Still, have, you still have to overcome those desires, but the Spirit of God gives you the power to do it. Okay. So that's uh, let them be anathema for believing that. Okay. For those who are born again, for in those who are born again, God hates nothing. Because there is no condemnation to those who are true, truly buried together with Christ by baptism unto death. Romans 6, 4. Let's take a look. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Right. So the old man is crucified with him. Well, who is the old man? Isn't it the person? Isn't it the spirit? Um, that the new man wants to serve Christ? And that the Holy Spirit is given to him as a helper to lead him to overcoming the flesh. So how is this being um, taken as um, God doesn't hate them anymore? Um, God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten Son, so that ever that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's not God hating the world that was sinning. It's God loving the world that was sinning. But that would be law-breaking, and that is the sin. The, the breaking of the law and the rejection of God. So he sent Christ to destroy that. That's the work of the devil. Right? So there is condemnation to those who have found righteousness and turned back to sin. You have to repent again. Who, who walk, now here it is right here, who walk not according to the flesh. 19, Romans 8, 1. We just looked at that, I think. Oh yeah, walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Why did they leave that out? See, to those who walk not according to the flesh. That's Romans 8, 1. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, um, yeah, we walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Okay. Putting off the old man and putting on the new, who is created according to God. 20. Ephesians 4.22 you put off concerning the former conversation the old man see here it is okay but you have not so learned Christ if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore put away lying, speak every man truth, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Okay, so um, there you go. Like, it's, it's about um, the re renewing of your mind, okay? Um, now back to the Council of Trent. They are made innocent, immaculate, pure, guiltless, and beloved of God, heirs indeed, and joint heirs with Christ. So there is nothing whatever to hinder their entrance into heaven. But this holy council, so they're saying that this happens to babies when they're baptized, right? But this whole holy council perceives and confesses that in the one baptized, there remains concupiscence or an inclination to sin, which is, since it is left for us, to wrestle with because the baptism didn't wash it away it cannot injure those who do not acquiesce but resist manfully by the grace of Jesus Christ so they understand this but how do babies do that indeed he who shall have striven lawfully shall be crowned right and that's true. But how does that apply to a baby? This uh, inclination to sin, which the apostle sometimes calls sin, Romans 6 to 8, the Holy Council declares the Catholic Church has never understood to be called sin. Well, if Paul called it sin, and he's the apostle, then how does the Catholic Church 
never understood it to be called sin, if Paul called it sin. That's confusing, okay, in the sense that it is truly and properly sin in those born again, but in the sense that it is of sin and inclines to sin. So they're saying once you're baptized, you can't sin? I think you can but if anyone who is of the contrary opinion, let him be anathema. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the kicker at the end. This Holy Council declares, however, that it is not its intention to include in this decree, which deals with original sin, the Blessed and Immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God. Uh, where did this come from? That this Mary, Mother of God, that has no original sin. Um, that's not in the Bible. Uh, that's a mother goddess. If you look at the book of Revelation, it shows all around God's throne. There's the Lamb of God offering himself. There's God. There's the four beasts, or four living creatures. There's the the elders, the 24 elders, the 144,000. There's no mother of God there. Uh, there's no talk of this sinless mother of God. That Jesus was born in the flesh. In our flesh. And he overcame sin in the flesh. He did, he was the first one, the firstborn of um, the resurrection. So he overcame sin in the flesh. So they just don't understand that. Okay, they had this idea that somehow Mary had to have holy flesh, and that Jesus was born with holy flesh. Um, there is no such teaching anywhere in the Bible about holy flesh. It says right here, John chapter 4, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is this, that spirit of Antichrist that you have heard it should come and even now already is in the world. Even the, during their time, it, it was already in the world. So stop waiting for the Antichrist. It's already here. Okay? You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God does not hear us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in this was manifested the love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us before baptism, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Okay? So, there you go. Jesus was born in the flesh. Same flesh as us. Because he, he's not going to ask us to do something that he couldn't do. He gave us, through baptism and confessing and, and turning to him in faith, he gave us the Holy Spirit, which is the same power that allowed him to overcome sin in the flesh. It over that Jesus, um, because he knew God at such an early age, he never sinned in the first place. But we, we didn't know God that well because it was hidden from us. And we didn't have the Holy Spirit. So God, Jesus brought that to us, that power to overcome sin. So that's what I think. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And that wraps up our discussion about original sin. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.